Hello and welcome to the third and final episode in this trilogy between myself and uh, my expert guest, uh, Rena Poppert. Hello, Rena. Hi, Rob. How are you? Yeah, very good. And uh, Rena um, is uh, the owner of a fantastic law firm that I've used, go to law firm for me, based in London. Um, and she, like me, has an incredible experience and track record along with her team on doing deals in the mergers and acquisitions space. So uh, Rena's input has been invaluable in the first two, and it will be in our third and final one. Um, I, I do say good morning, but of course it could be good afternoon or good evening, uh, depending on where you're tuning in from around the world. Uh, last uh, webinar that I did, uh, last two actually, in fact, um, the chap was dialing in at five o'clock in the morning because he's in Colombia. Um, so uh, wherever you are in the world, welcome. And uh, one thing I would say is that this series of training webinars are simply that. You may have come across, and certainly I've uh, um, been on the receiving end of hard sell over the internet. People offering courses, free courses, chargeable courses, um, but it's one big sales pitch. Um, hopefully you've noticed in the last two episodes, and the same will be true of this third one today, uh, there's no hard sell from us. We want to provide knowledge, information, get you thinking um, about the plan ahead and uh, what you need to watch out for. So um, let's just activate the screen and we'll delve in. Um, just to remind you, there are two key purposes to this uh, webinar series. No matter where you are in the world, what industry sector you're in, Rena and I will be sharing some universal truths about selling your business for a top price. Um, and part of that is we want to go through the sale process and the pitfalls to watch out for. And the, the intention for us is really so that you're better equipped for the journey ahead, whether it's next year, three years time, five years time, 10 years time, um, these truths don't have an expiry date. They've been true over the past dec few decades and they will remain true going forward. So um, if you haven't seen the first two videos, stop this one <laughs> because it, it won't make as much sense listening to this third one unless you've seen the first two. But you can see the topics that we've covered. We've covered a lot of ground between us, uh, Rena and I. Um, so do watch the uh, episodes in order. Um, this episode, assuming that you have watched the two, um, we're going to cover three topics, um, competitive tension, due diligence, and life after sale. It's going to be about half an hour's worth of um, material to go through um, for Rena and I, and then we're going to finish like we did with the first two episodes, a live Q&A, and uh, I've got a number of questions already that have been submitted. Um, so that's the content. It doesn't look a huge amount, but actually there's quite a bit of content. So uh, uh, we're gonna head off in that direction. And as I've said in the previous two episodes, after you've watched the three hours worth of training, you've got a decision to make. It's like red pill, blue pill. You either do something with that knowledge, whatever that is, or you can simply do nothing. It's your choice. Um, our responsibility today is to provide the information, food for thought and knowledge to help you on your path. So, competitive tension. I bang on about this and I have done in the 20 odd years I've been uh, selling businesses. It is one of the fundamentals to achieving a top price because anyone can sell a business for a low enough price. We're talking here in this series about selling for a premium price and it's fundamental competitive tension. So I want to unpack that a bit. Uh, I did say uh, yesterday in the second episode that one buyer is no buyer. And I really do mean that. You might think that the company in front of you that's expressed a bit of interest, initial interest, is going to be the eventual suitor. The odds are unlikely. 80% of businesses don't sell first time anyway. Um, and the first company you come across or the first company or two you come across may not be the eventual buyer. And there's a danger built in there. 
initially when someone comes to you out of the blue and they say, oh, you know, it, there's usual pattern to it. Um, been watching your business for a few years, been really impressed by the growth you've achieved and the brand reputation you've got in the marketplace, blah, blah, blah. Um, would you be interested in selling it to me? That's paraphrased. That is a real pitfall. Um, one, they may be on a fishing trip. Uh, usually um, that sort of call comes from a competitor. So you've got to be wary, first of all, um, because uh, their agenda might be different to what you think it is. Um, in any event, one buyer cannot be, um, can't create competitive tension. If they made an offer, you don't know what to compare it to. There's no rule of thumb to say what your business is worth. It's what the market says it's worth. Um, so it's beholden on you if you want to sell your business for a top price, and I'll bring Rena in in a second on this, is to actually get a number of potential suitors around the table at the same time. Well, not in the same meeting, obviously. That would be vaguely adversarial. Um, but um, to actually go out and find alternative buyers to the person that's uh, approach you in the first place. So, Rita, do you want, do you want to add anything to that point? Yeah, I, you, you, you're, you're spot on, Bob, that one buyer is no buyer because there's no guarantee that buyer is actually going to buy um, and at what price as well. And remember, we want to sell or you want to sell for the highest price possible as well, and you're not going to get that with one buyer. The only way you'll be able to get that is if you can create this sort of competitive tension, as Rob says, between a few uh, interested parties um, and create that almost FOMO, the fear of missing out or whatever the acronym is. Um, but that's the way to sort of drive the price for the business. Yeah, I definitely agree with that. Um, given, given on the premise that you don't know what your business is actually worth, it's the market that will decide. If you're not creating a marketplace in which to sell your business, then you don't know whether there's a better deal around the corner. And it's not just about money, it could be the terms. Because someone might offer you five million pounds for your business, but spread it over the next three to five years. Whereas someone else could offer five million, but payable all up front. Which one are you gonna choose? Which one is riskier for you? So um, it's essential that you create a marketplace. I don't mean that you declare who you are, you give your numbers, put it out on the internet and uh, on your LinkedIn page and, and, and get people to share it. I don't mean that. I mean, a targeted marketing piece where you go out to specific strategic potential buyers for your business and approach them and uh, have conversations with them um, with a view to them making an indicative offer on your business. Um, I found from doing this over a couple of decades that you need to approach at least 50, ideally 70 to, to, to 100, but at least 50 potential targets home and abroad that will cascade to some initial interest of between 20 to 30 of them will want further details under a non-disclosure agreement and uh, that will then cascade down into eight maybe nine meetings with different buyers and out of that you should get four offers indicative offers and now you're in the driving seat and, uh, and all four offers you decline very politely and go back with a commercially reasoned argument as to why they should sharpen their pencil. So there's a bit of sales strategy as well, selling strategy, uh, negotiation ability. So one buyer is no buyer. Trust me, yeah, you don't want that. Um, you want to give yourself, apart from additional money to take off the table, you also want to give yourself uh, some options because it might be that the highest bidder isn't necessarily the best fit for, you, for your business going forward. And given that most people, current owners, have to stay on post-sale, you've got to work with these people. You've got to like them. And no, it doesn't matter how much money they're putting on the table. Trust me, if you don't like the person, or <clears throat> it won't last more than a week. And you could end up by leaving the table, leaving cash on the table as well. So um, do yourself a favor, um, go out and get some competitive alternative offers to the one um, that you've been provided with. Building on that, uh, from experience, I did a quick totter. Last time I totted this up, the difference between the highest offer 
and the lowest offer on a project on average was 134%. Go figure. They've, they've looked at the same information memoranda. They've looked at the same three years audited accounts and they're coming up with wildly different numbers for a variety of reasons. Um, one of them might be they're just tough negotiators and they want to um, provide a low ball offer. But it's wider than that, I found. It's actually that what your business is worth is what it's worth to them. And lastly, again, building on that, it's not uncommon for an original low ball offer to be doubled or tripled during the period of a number of months of negotiation. So don't think that their first offer is their best one because do you know what? It invariably isn't. These are trained, skilled negotiators. And you may not be. Um, certainly not perhaps in the world of M&A. So watch out for that one. Any further thought or comment, Rena, before I move on to the next slide, just on that sort of competitive tension and, and getting a number of offers in the pot? Yeah, I was just going to add that actually the, the, the sellers aren't necessarily the right people to create this competitive tension as well or to necessarily speak to the buyers as well um, for a number of reasons. One is the seller's too close to the business and there's a lot of emotion involved as, as well. Um, you need a professional to be able to put together this information memorandum and to be able to sell this on your behalf. And I understand because I'm, I'm a business owner um, as well. And I understand that, you know, it's hard to digest that because I think I know my business better than anybody else. But not necessarily when you're selling or when you're creating this competitive tension. It's always a good idea to get somebody involved to help you with the process. Brilliant. Thank you. And uh, I, I mentioned in the previous two episodes, um, this is not, these aren't a hard sell, these sessions. I've been on some hard sell courses, um, but this isn't. The only thing I'm selling is giving away a copy of my book. In there, it talks about competitive tension. And in fact, um, you, might, you might remember from the uh, episode yesterday, uh, I had a higher stack of books <laughs> behind me. <laughs> I, I love, oh, Chris, <laughs> Christina, my other half, loves sending out books by post. She loves going to the post office, sending hard copies out uh, to anyone in the UK. If you're overseas, we can send uh, any ebook copy for you uh, by email. Um, so I'm, I'm all for sending out complimentary information and uh, leaving it with the recipient. Um, so yeah, so I talk heavily about co creating competitive tension. It's, it's one of the top things you must do. It's one of the 11 commandments is to create that. So I think I might have stressed competitive tension enough, Rena, on that one. So we'll move on. Um, part of that, Developing the idea of getting a pool of interested parties who are funded, relevant, and could add something strategically to your business, and also theirs, if they were lucky enough to acquire your shares, is why, why do acquirers or investors buy into a business? So this is a top list, and I'm sure, Rena, uh, you'll be looking out for anyone to add to it, but this is my top list of motives. Um, in fact, I'm going through the process of buying a business myself. Um, and uh, I, I know this to be true from personal experience, client base. But not just client base, how many? What's the breadth? Um, are they blue chip? Do they have longer term contracts? Do they have a three or five year framework agreement attached to them? Because that has added value to the commerciality and the value of your business. So what is the quality of the client base? And once you understand that, then you can put that into a sales prospectus and information memoranda as one of the, one of the things to hook the reader, the potential acquirer for your business. So number one is client base. Um, sometimes this can be, growth potential can be uh, over-egged, I found. If you, if you go too heavy on growth potential, and um, the buyer is likely to say, particularly if they're a commercially seasoned negotiator, oh, well, that's fine. Then I was going to give you 10 million pounds cash on completion. But um, all this growth potential, what I'll do is I'll spread it over the next three years. So be careful not to over. You should talk about growth potential, i.e. what could be done in the business going forward under new ownership. And or if it's not 
um, under new ownership, maybe if you didn't sell the business, you can say this to the potential buyer. If we didn't sell the business, because that's an option open to us, because it's a good business, it's growing. Um, these are the sorts of things that we would do. This is how much it's likely to cost. And this is the return on investment. Really basic future PL to grab their interest. Um, some buyers want to spread both within a country. If you're up in the north of England and you have no representation south of Birmingham, you might want to buy a business in the south to give yourself national coverage. And similarly, the same is true for international expansion as well, to build a bridgehead, have an international footprint for that business. It might be that you've developed a lot of R&D on products and services, and that is an attraction to a buyer. Uh, and linked with that, we spoke quite a bit, didn't we, yesterday, uh, Rena, yesterday on intellectual property. Um, if someone's got a patent, worldwide patent, or even if it's just in the country of origin, in the market that they serve, that has tremendous value potentially to the right buyer. Um, clearly number six there, if you combine two businesses, there's usually um, room um, for saving costs. And I don't necessarily mean staffing, although you don't necessarily need two FDs, do you, Rena? <laughs> when two businesses combine. So watch out FDs. Um, but there could be a way where you combining two businesses of, of finding a way to save money um, quite sensibly um, in the way that the two businesses operate. But also it's, it's far more than cost savings with two businesses combined. The actual bigger number is when you combine two businesses, you've got two client bases, two sales teams, and they can cross sell and upsell between those two respective businesses. So actually the ability to be able to generate far greater sales revenues is increased by two businesses combining as one. Um, I did mention yesterday about pharmaceutical industry, but there are industry, other industries. Some buyers, their primary motive for acquiring a business or businesses is to gain that talent, that workforce, those skills and expertise contained within the target business. Uh, this happens sometimes. Um, I might want to buy your business because I don't want a competitor of mine getting your business. And not necessarily that I'm going to do much with it necessarily, but I just don't want it getting in the hands of competitors. Uh, I haven't mentioned profit yet, <laughs> return on investment, but certainly there. Um, and it's incumbent. Are, are there any others that you would add to that list, Rena? I was just thinking about it as you as you're going along, and, and you've got all of them covered. Actually, everything that I was thinking of, and um, I, I see a lot of defensive acquisitions as well, where there's something nearby or in the geographical location, and either you know, the, the buyer's going to buy it or somebody else is going to. So um, that that seems to be um, quite a popular one. But yeah, all, all of those will, will matter, and I think it depends on the appetite of the purchaser and exactly what they're looking for. It might be some of them, it might be a bit of all of this as well. Brilliant. Yeah, and I, I would say with this, when you meet for the first time an interested party, or even if you have a phone call with them, initial Zoom call or something, be mindful of their motives for purchase. This isn't a job interview for you as the seller with the buyer. This is for you to find out as much information as you can from them, because sure as eggs is eggs, they're gonna be doing it to you. You need to find out what their motives for purchase are, because that will help you assess their level of interest. Uh, because people who are very keen for something and have got a strong motivation will pay more. It's just like any, you think about um, things in your own life. Maybe for me as a petrol head, maybe it's a car. You know, and you're, it, you're thinking, you know, I really, really want this. I'm, I'm prepared to increase my offer in order to beat the competition, because I really do want this whatever that thing is. Um, it, this is quite a skill because you need to ask lots of questions of the potential buyer. This is why I say, don't do DIY selling business. Don't do it. Um, get a professional um, to run the process and represent you, facilitate those meetings, because this is what a good M&A advisory firm will do. And if you don't know a good M&A advisory firm, contact me, because I do. Uh, but this is what they should be doing on your behalf. And the good ones do. 
So uh, I'm going to switch tack a little bit to uh, definitely your field of expertise, particularly, Rena, as a lawyer, um, surviving due diligence, because I did say in a previous episode, uh, there's only one purpose for due diligence, really. That's for the buyer to chip you on price and terms. There ain't no advantage for the seller, really, uh, compared to the buyer. So just what I said. Uh, we talked in the previous episode about disclosure. You must disclose material information at the appropriate time. And if you don't know what the appropriate time is, again, you should have the right advisors, not only an M&A advisory firm, but also your commercial lawyer um, to get that guidance. Because uh, trust me, we are not experts in this as individuals. Um, and we need to rely on the expertise of other people. But uh, it, it's, it's essential. If, if you don't disclose material information, you will get chipped on price and terms, guarantee it. Um, and it could be just before completion. So what are you gonna do then as a seller? Are you gonna crumble? So really important to give appropriate information at the right time. Um, uh, I'll bring you in on this particular one, Rena. Uh, Heads of terms mistakenly is a bit of a myth. Some people think it's the actual sale contract. And it isn't, is it? Heads of terms, um, yes. I, we could spend months and months getting some heads of terms drawn up and going back and forth. But what the heads of terms are, it's a very important document. And it's an agreement to agree is the best way to put it. So it will capture all the salient terms of the transaction of what you've agreed with the buyer. So the purchase price, any earnouts, whether you're going to be staying on as an employee or a consultant for how long, how much you're going to be paid, things like that. So they're all the salient terms. The headline points of the transaction are captured in this heads of terms document. Um, and it's important that these are in there because what that will do, it will smooth the process once the lawyers get involved because otherwise the lawyers will have a field day and trying to make things up as they're going along in the transaction. Whereas this heads of terms document is presented to both lawyers. Um, so we're guided as lawyers as to what's been agreed and what should be reflected in the actual share purchase or share purchase and sale agreement. Now the heads of terms isn't actually a legally binding contract, save as for some of the actual clauses in there. So some of the clauses which would be binding would be, for example, costs. Uh, so there'll be a clause which says that both parties, each party is responsible for their own legal costs. There'll be another one about confidentiality, which will say that um, both parties need to abide by the confidentiality agreement if there is one. If not, it will have a clause in there about confidentiality. And similarly, the governing law to say that this contract, this heads of terms, is actually governed by English law. So save us for those few clauses, the rest of it actually isn't legally binding, but what it does do, it sets the intention. So during the course of the transaction, if you have a buyer who says, well, actually, and he, he or she changes the terms of the, of the agreement, as the seller, we can firmly go back to the heads of terms and say, well, hang on a minute, this is what was agreed, even though it's not legally binding because the intention was there. And it's really important that you get lawyers involved at the beginning before signing the heads of terms. I've seen some awful heads of terms and actually what it does is it causes more confusion during the process, which in turn means delays and more costs and more frustration for all parties as well. Brilliant, thank you, Rena. And just a, a, a twist on that same theme. I've been on training courses for buyers. Um, and one of the best practices um, given in a training course is to not, uh, is to say to the seller, the buyer to say to the seller, um, we don't, we can dispense with legal advisors, don't need that. We can just get it done between yourselves. It'll be, it'll be cheaper, it'll be quicker. We can complete in two weeks. Just sign here on heads of terms that they've pre-prepared. Don't. <laughs> It, there's nothing wrong with them. There's nothing illegal for the buyer to do that. Just don't do it. Because as Rena says, it, it, invariably it will lead to a whole 
potpourri of problems that you'll have that will come up in due diligence. Yes, you do need a properly qualified and experienced commercial lawyer like Rena to go through it. Don't sign it. Please don't sign it. Even if you think you know what you're signing, don't. I think I might have made that clear, really. <laughs> don't fall into that trap because the reason why they want you to sign head to terms is one of the, one of the two conditions um, is that you have to give exclusivity for a period of time. And it could be three months. They could have slipped six months exclusivity. I don't know. Even though they said it will complete in two weeks. But they, uh, exclusivity means you can't speak with any other potential buyer. You're giving away a huge amount and you don't want that. Going back to the first slide in this session, you need to create competitive tension and maintain it. There will come a point where you've got a, 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 an offer that you're prepared to accept, at least in outline terms. That's when you give that exclusivity period, but not before, not prematurely, um, and uh, certainly not in a hotel lobby where they've pre-prepared heads of terms for you to sign. Just sign here. Right. Um, I, I'd be interested, Vina, in a moment in your view of this. It, it comes up sometimes, um, not regularly, but it does come up, and it has come up a few times of late, an abandonment fee in the heads of terms um, or a deposit asked for um, on either side, actually, by the buyer and sometimes by the seller. Uh, what, what's your take on that whole area? So usually, from, from my experience, it's a seller who will ask the buyer to show some, sort of, some form of commitment. And that commitment is a, a deposit. And so the deposit, you'd have a separate deposit agreement which governs how much is paid as a deposit, that this deposit comes off the purchase price at the end, but also what happens to this deposit amount if, uh, the transaction doesn't proceed. So if the buyer changes their mind or the buyer doesn't get funding or there's something material in the disclosure that the buyer says, actually, I'm walking away and you know uh, the wording is no prudent buyer would buy, what happens to that deposit? So you'd have different circumstances as to when the deposit is returned to the buyer and when it is forfeited and the seller keeps it. So ultimately, it is really a commitment fee. Um, there's no hard and fast rule whether or not a transaction has a deposit um, payable. It depends, to, to be honest, in some sectors, um, particularly, for example, healthcare, hospitality, hotel transactions, there will be some sort of commitment fee. Uh, but other sectors, uh, so nurseries and childcare, it's unusual to have a deposit or a commitment fee. So it, it depends, but is, is, the, is the answer whether a, a deposit is payable, but it shows commitment from the buyer as well. And I think you've got to be careful with this as well. As well, it shows commitment, but it could go the other way. If you've got a buyer who is private equity or a large corporation that, that's buying, asking them for a deposit, I don't think is going to go down too well. So you, you, you've really got to think about this before asking for a commitment fee as well. Yeah, I would concur with that. Um, because clearly both buyer and seller are incurring costs, aren't they, during this period? Um, arguably, the seller has because they've engaged uh, an M&A advisor. They may have asked their accountant to do some additional financial report work um, and got their lawyer to look at the heads of terms document before signing. So. Um, but, but, but the buyer will incur costs as well because uh, usually quite a, a lot larger because they tend to be a, a bigger firm, the buyer, um, and they'll employ um, magic circle firms and uh, top 10 accountancy firms. So there's some big costs for both sides. Often I find um, that in head to terms, it's just a split mm -hmm. that they cover their own costs. And I think that, you know, I found that that usually works as a good default position. But uh, as Rena says, just watch out for this. Uh, you definitely need the right lawyer. If you don't know the right lawyer, I'm speaking to one at, right at this moment in time. Uh, yeah, and uh, a plea for accountants. Some accountants are really good. 
and are up for the job. Uh, some are mediocre and possibly could lose you the transaction. Uh, and some are just appalling. And uh, there's a real spread. So if your accountant's not up to the job, change them. It might be 30 years ago when you set up your business, perhaps there's a one man band or something, you've got the village accountant, you know, and maybe, you, you know, there's a good relationship between you, but your business has grown. It's become a multi million pound business. It's employing 50 staff, but you've still got the same accountant. So your business has grown, but your accountant may not have grown with your business. So do make sure you've got a competent accountant that's responsive um, and they can react to things quickly that they need to uh, under the due diligence process. Getting financial information is one of the fundamental promptly. The longer a transaction goes on for, the less likely it is to ever complete. It's called deal fatigue. It, someone pulls out. Um, uh, and something I've always done when I've run projects um, selling is, is to remind, you have to keep reminding all the parties involved, there is a, uh, an agreed completion date that's looming and people should make every endeavor to hit that completion date because we don't want it dragging on because of deal fatigue. Head to terms. I, I, if you're thinking that you can get away with, I mean, some people don't have heads of terms. I would say it's a best practice. Um, as long as you don't go into the granular detail, Rena was uh, alluding to, because it isn't the contract, but it is important that both parties, buyer and seller, confirm what they think they've agreed to in principle. Um, and it will save time and money later on with your lawyer um, if you can iron out the wrinkles early doors and everyone is on the same page. So how do you create effective heads of terms? Well, you could ask your lawyer to do it or alternatively, you could draft one up for your lawyer to look at. You do, we, we covered this a moment ago, it's knowing what heads of terms is and what it isn't. It isn't the sale contract. So it doesn't need to be chapter and verse. It needs to be the key things that both parties believe they've agreed to. Um, and, and some of the, it's the main planks of the deal, but do run it past your lawyer before um, sending it across to the other side. Uh, talks about disclosure, make sure material information that will affect price is disclosed. And certainly um, during the process of due diligence, you talked, Rena, quite a lot about disclosure letter. Um, when we're talking about warranties and indemnities, it's really important to disclose everything that's material because you don't want to be chipped last minute on price. Did mention it's a summary, it's not the contract. Uh, Rena mentioned it's not legally binding except for a couple of areas, which is the exclusivity that I've just referred to and uh, confidentiality. You still can't speak about this proposed transaction to the world and their wife. Um, I normally go, I don't, I don't ask you for your experience, Rena, on this in a moment. I normally go for three months exclusivity or three months completion. Um, three months I find typically is sufficient for all the moving parts to work together to get the, the deal over the line in three months. But do, do you have other experiences? Uh, three months is about right, to be honest. And I, I, I say the same thing, unless until there's some sort of regulatory approval, which is required, which we know it takes a minimum of, for example, two months or three months, etc. Um, so if you need some FCA approval or in, anything like that, then we can factor that in. But on, as, a, as, a, as a rule of thumb, three months is, is about right. Anything more, um, it carries on for a bit too long. I mean, it will spill over or it may spill over. So you should just be aware of that. But if we have a target date of three months, then at least all the parties are working towards that date. Yeah, and just as a bolt-on tip to that, um, if you've agreed a three-month completion date, and you get towards that three month period and you know it's not gonna get over the line within that agreed time period. Um, by all means, as a seller, be prepared to extend that period of time um, that's needed, but you don't necessarily have to extend the heads of terms exclusivity period. You could just leave it as it is and it, and it expires, the exclusivity expires in three months, uh, after three months, 
Um, and then the buyer knows that they've got to uh, get their act together if it's delays from the buy side. Um, you don't, there isn't an automatic obligation for you to extend the exclusivity period just because it runs over time a bit. So keep, keep that up your sleeve if you need to. Uh, talked about splitting costs. It's usually both parties, quite, the, the norm is both parties cover their own costs, which is a good, fair and equitable way to start a conversation. Um, people often think that the hard bit is early on is finding the buyers and, and getting offers. That's the easy bit by comparison. The hard bit is the latter part, the part we're talking about now, which is the latter stages, the due diligence phase and the renegotiation of terms and sometimes price. Um, so he, here's some suggestions as you can, how you can keep people together. Um, you as a seller, don't get greedy. Um, I've lost count of the amount of times I've had someone say at the outset, Rob, I'd like to get 10 million for my business, 10 to 12 million. Then you get 15 million for them a few months down the line after a competitive detention process. Now they want 20. <laughs> so hang on a minute. <laughs> Six, nine months ago, you wanted 10 to 12. Now you want 20. Oh, well, I realize how, how valuable it is now, Rob. Um, and that's a real example of one a few years ago. Um, but this is not uncommon. This isn't an isolated thing. I, I, trust me, I do understand for many, many people, this is a one-off transaction. It, it, my business is my pension. But I mean, that's a, a subject for another video. It shouldn't be. But for a lot of people, it's a one-off opportunity in their life to generate a sufficient capital sum that they could use for future financial security. Um, by all means, we want to maximize premium value, but not at the expense of the deal collapsing, because there'll come a point with any buyer where they think, do you know what? No. Nah. <laughs> We think the seller is being unreasonable. Uh, and if you don't know where that point is, I've said it before and I'll say it again, get a proper M&A advisor that can negotiate terms alongside with you. That, that is quite an art, is knowing how far you can push something and how. And I've found, I've found both working with clients where I've sold their businesses and also uh, with myself, with my own transactions, it's essential to keep goodwill and good faith between both parties. If you lose that, um, the signs aren't good that the, uh, the deal is going to stay together. So make sure you maintain goodwill. And that means how you communicate by email or on the phone or a Zoom call needs to be in the proper way, as opposed to it getting personalized. And uh, often it's the seller that takes things personally because they're an owner manager, they're not a corporate. And this matters to them. The business is like a child to them and, and, and quite e easy for them to take umbrage at what's said from the other party. So do maintain the goodwill. Um, do be flexible. In good, this is not just for M&A and selling a business. This is sales negotiation tactics 101. Is be open-minded and be prepared to flex on things. And a key tip is you need to know what your red lines are, the things that you cannot negotiate, but there'll be other stuff in the middle that you are prepared to negotiate on because it has less value to you. Well, it might have those, some of those things might have high value to the buyer. So negotiate, do an exchange of things um, and just be open to what they're saying. Try and put yourself in their shoes for a moment. Um, I, I'm not saying that you crumble on things, but you need to understand it from understand what they're saying, because sometimes people misunderstand we're human beings and we can misinterpret what's being said, particularly in email, especially in email. Uh, I, I think I, I have mentioned it a couple of times I'm <laughs> flying the flag for lawyers. It is essential. If you get if you instruct a lawyer that's not experienced in M&A um, and and are not pragmatic, it could kill a deal. Trust me, it could kill a deal. I've seen it happen. Uh, good businesses have not sold because the lawyer that the business owners have used um, is not up to the job. Uh, they've usually chose them on price. So um, don't let it be price, let it be on value for money and expertise. Ask them how many, you know, what sort of transaction, go through some of the transactions that they've led. 
but you need to be sure that they're up to the job your lawyers because um, they're not necessarily all the same. Uh, don't go to the pub or a wine bar with a potential buyer and agree things over a bottle or three of Merlot. Um, in fact, I, I, I wouldn't advise doing that anyway. Do that on the day of completion with a bottle of champagne. Um, anything that's agreed verbally key thing, needs to be documented. So if you're having a conversation, a phone call or Zoom call, make sure that's summarized in an email straight after. So there can be no dispute later on. It's amazing how people get business amnesia. And uh, this is, this, this is a, uh, a major thing uh, that a, a really good M&A advisory firm would do. Weekly updates, get everyone on the phone, everyone on the Zoom call to have a progress report from the interested parties. You'll have your account, you certainly have both sets of lawyers, M&A advisory firm, there might be someone representing the buyer on the M&A side, uh, accountants, FDs. It's usually quite a big call. But it's really important that everyone is kept up to date with progress. Don't just rely on emails because sometimes people don't see emails or they've got a really busy inbox. This needs to be a weekly uh, meeting of the uh, various stakeholders and the people involved in completing. Anything else you'd add, Rena, to that about how to keep the deal together? Because you'll be at the front end like uh, like I've been over the years. Uh, yeah, and, and following on from the weekly progress meetings, just to have an action list as well as to what's going to happen between it, um, you know, that call after that call and then the next call and who's doing what, because then um, the that, that will be picked up on the next meeting uh, and the weekly progress call. And, um, no lawyer wants to, or, or the buyer or seller wants to say, well, oh, actually, I didn't get time to do that. So it will make sure that we're progressing as well. Brilliant. And I've mentioned competitive tension. Keep it throughout. Until that money drops into your bank account, competitive tension will be your friend as the seller. Um, the first transaction, I spent seven years apprenticeship as a general manager of the uh, M&A large, uh, what became a very large M&A advisory firm. I was the GM um, and I spent seven years building that business from a million and a half turnover to 15 million turnover over those seven years. Um, but I was doing it as an employee. When I left that company and set up on my own, micropreneur, I think they call it, Rena. Um, Doing the same sort of thing. This was my first, this is the first person that signed up with me to sell his business. Uh, and um, I thought, oh, well, that's brilliant. I've, I've been doing it for seven years, but not as Rob Goddard. I've been doing it under a company name. So I was so chuffed that Tony trusted me, uh, Tony and his wife, Heather, to sell his business. And uh, life, I, I, I learned, speak, speaking with Tony and spending time with Tony and Heather at their home, um, life after sale, actually, we've gone full circle, is essential. Because I asked Tony, what do you want to do as soon as you've sold your business through me? And he said, I've got my dad's car in the garage. I've had it there for years. It needs restoring. It's a 1936 Morris Singer convertible. Um, and he he hadn't had time to restore it because he'd been too busy growing a business. Um, and sure enough, about, about six months after I, uh, I sold the business, um, I was up in his neck of the woods in the north and I dropped in, uh, pre-arranged, dropped in. And the first thing he said to me when I arrived at his home was, let me take you around to the garage. Let me show you what I've done. And that crystallized for me in my life why I do what I do which is I want to help people finish one chapter in their life and start a new one. And uh, I'm going to finish on that note, um, my life after sale, because I sold up last year. Um, so what are the sort of things that I've been getting involved with? I had type two diabetes, undiagnosed until I went for uh, key man insurance two years ago, three years ago. Um, so I decided that I needed to move more and eat less. Um, definitely had more time on the water, life after sail with a boat, under the water. Uh, that's on an Airbus 380 to uh, the Emirates. Um, 
in the desert with some of my kids if you remember from my first episode i've got six children that's three of them on uh, uh, my two-wheeled prepared uh, propelled vehicle um nothing nothing to do with work there <laughs> those are the highlights but there's more <laughs> i actually got engaged a year ago and in fact i'm getting married this august in albania um and but all sorts of things uh, you can see i think water there rena and the aquatic theme is on all those photographs is quite uh, quite pronounced and the, and the photograph on the far right the uh, top 10 uh, traits of highly resilient people and suicide success i've become an author i've got six books out there now so all those sorts of things you can do and my question to you, leave with you before we go into the live Q&A, is what's stopping you? If you're a business owner and you've been putting off the decision for one reason or another, um, what's actually stopping you from actually taking the first few steps? I don't mean to sell it tomorrow. I mean to prepare your business for sale. Make it sale ready. Even if you never end up selling it, you'll have a better, bigger, healthier company as a result. Um, and that's me signing my life away with the uh, the buyers uh, the, in the offices of the uh, the buyer the, the the sorry the legal uh, the lawyers for the buyer so that was that was a special moment for me taken by the uh, the uh, lawyer uh, i wanted to encapsulate that moment actually because that was the moment that my life started the new chapter by signing all the plethora of documents that you wonderful solicitors and lawyers create for us to sign that is the end and what's well, the end of our trilogy and uh, i do have a few questions i'm mindful of time i did say there was a lot of content but we probably have about 15 to 20 minutes so i'm gonna go through questions ah samir do you remember samir rena from yesterday he's the I one do, i think yes. is an accountant <laughs> um, i do i do <laughs> we've got, we got another question um surely buyers will come up with similar valuations if they have the same information well I, I did cover that. They don't. <laughs> you would think that. Do you know what, Samir? You would think that logically, wouldn't you? Same information, same business, same financial records, hugely wide variation of valuations because it's what it's worth to that particular buyer. There isn't a standard price. This isn't a listed company on the stock exchange where there's a price earnings ratio in the FT every week. These are privately owned companies and their, their valuations will vary wildly depending on which buyer is in, you're in front of. Um, number two from Paul, I, oh, it's quite long, I'll have to paraphrase it. I was approached by a buyer who said that there was no need for lawyers. Uh, yeah, <laughs> I think, yeah, what Paul is saying is that he's had this um, himself. So those training courses are working where they're trying to train and equip normally newbie potential buyers. These are people that think they can buy a business with no money down. Um, so thank you for that. That was more of a comment from Paul. Um, it's out there, so beware of it. Uh, all right, this question for me. Actually, you, you might be able to answer this as well, Rena. Um, what's the highest multiple you've sold a business for? That comes from Brian. Um, from memory, uh 26 multiple of 26 times ebitda for all you uh, fds and accountants out there so six times profit before uh, 26 times before uh, times uh profit before tax um the lowest i remember was 3.4 that's in my 20 year history so you've got 3.4 multiple and 26 the average uh last time i measured it was about 9.4 just over 9.4 multiple but we don't sell businesses on multiples. We only calculate the multiple after um, the transaction has gone through. Because um, people don't pay you in multiples, they pay you, pay you in pounds, shillings and pence if you're in the UK. Um, but it is interesting to record it afterwards. Uh, have you, from your angle, Rena, are, are, are you familiar with the multiples and what's, what you're seeing at the moment, perhaps? in terms of multiples on business? Yeah, it's, it's interesting. And, and it goes back to supply and demand um, as, as well. And actually how much the buyer wants the business. 
And um, if you're talking about particular sectors as well, um, you know, particular sectors and, and buying a business is sometimes hard to come by. So that drives up the price and drives up the multiples. So nobody really looks at the multiple until they're actually, you know, put an offer in and it's accepted. And then they work backwards and realize actually how much they're paying and what the multiple is. Um, so it's sector driven, it's also supply and demand, and it's also how much it's worth to a buyer and what, what the buyer is prepared to, prepared to pay. And if you're not familiar with multiples and you're watching this, um, all it is really is how many years is the buyer or investor prepared to wait um, in order to start making a return on their investment? What's the cross point? Um, what's the break even point for, their, for them on their investment? Um, based on current profitability. The higher the multiple, the more they're going to pay for your business. And multiples can vary wildly depending on industry sector. You mentioned it as well, Rena, the, the type of company, how it's set up. So you can have two businesses in the same industry that will sell for quite significantly different multiples because of the nature of how those respective businesses work and operate. Um, I always, with when I'm preparing business owners for sale, I always say a multiple of what? And they, they often mention some, they say net profit quite often. I said, well, which net profit? Because there isn't just one. I, I've, I've found out there's eight definitions of profit. Um, which one are you talking about? And over what period of time? Are you talking about this year's net profit? Last year's actual net profit? The last three years? What about the next few years forecasted, projected profit? Where does that, so when buyers are talking about multiples, be very careful um, about what they're referring to, a multiple of what? Uh, next question, how do you factor in potential growth into a business valuation? Um, that's a really good question. Um, I, 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 I kind of touched on it earlier when I was talking, when you're sitting down with a, a potential buyer, explain to them over the next few years what could be done with the business and put a couple of numbers around it what will it cost to bring in those changes um and what is the anticipated return on investment that way then in the head of the buyer they're thinking right okay so they're currently making a million pound on the bottom line but over the next three years um, realistically that could well double for example. Now they're thinking, I've got to factor some of that, that future growth into the valuation. Um, and they'll, they'll often do it by way of, an Rena talked yesterday about earn outs and deferred periods. Um, that, that again is an art, not a science. Is there anything you'd add to that, Rena, in terms of how do you factor in potential growth into an offer? Yeah, you've all, you've almost got to sell the um, vision uh, and the future to the to the buyer as to what you would do if you were still the seller uh, and what you could do and how that will um, impact the profit, the direction that the business is going as well. So you're you're it, it's you're, you're selling this dream, if you like, as to what still can be done with the business. And what opportunity the buyer still buyer has to do this because you you've not tapped into it, and, mm. and the numbers as well to actually quantify some of that so the buyer can actually you know see see the numbers and the figures around them. Yeah, mm. good. And final question. I'm just mindful of time, and there's one one thing I want to leave the audience with. Um, uh, Brian again. Uh, <laughs> you'll love this one, reader. This is one for you. Uh, typically, how much are legal costs? <laughs> typically. They are as cheap as chips. Um, <laughs> and <laughs> I like sweet potato fries myself. Yeah, yeah, more healthy, more healthy. Um, if you are going to go to a lawyer who doesn't have proper M&A experience, then you will, you'll be quoted something extremely low. Um, Lawyers will give you a, um, a, a cost based on the transaction. So it's sometimes to do with the value as well, 
but also to do with the transactions to how much work is involved. Is there deferred consideration? Is there earnouts? And all of that, you know, is there going to be a shareholders agreement? Is there going to be uh, a consultancy agreement or employment trust? All of that is factored in. In terms of what the cost is going to be, I mean, if you get anything lower than five to ten thousand pounds or something, that is just I won't even look at it. And in fact, I would question it. And the best way to know whether or not you're getting a good deal or whether it's industry norm is speak to a few lawyers. Um, you know, speak to different lawyers, ask them about the experience, ask them the transaction size that, that, that they worked on, um, ask them what they're working on now as well. There's absolutely no harm. And get some quotes. Get, get a, you know, three to five quotes from different lawyers ranging from, you know, uh, larger firms, medium firms to small firms, and you will get a good range and you'll be able to sift out quite quickly who's got the expertise and what you should be pay paying as well. So um, the cheapest isn't always the best, neither is the most expensive, but it's going to be a right fit for you. And then that, that's how I, would, how I would answer that question. Brilliant. Um, my granny... Uh, in London, East End of London, used to say, buy cheap, buy twice. <laughs> so um, do include Rena. I'll, 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 I'll raise the flag for Rena. Do make sure that she's one of those three to five that you get a quote from. OK, so I'm going to leave you with final thing. Um, it, if there's other questions that come up, by the way, after watching this, do ping Rena or myself an email. I'll leave you with the contact details on the last slide. Um, but I'll leave you with a question. What are you going to do now, next? Well, uh, definitely read my book. We've still got a few copies. You can see behind my shoulder there. I think that way. Okay. Um, have a read my book. Inform yourself. Of, that's 20 years experience I've had in selling businesses. The do's and don'ts. The 11 commandments and the seven cardinal sins. Uh, do drop me an email to get a, a copy sent to you in the post. Um, connect with both myself and Rena on LinkedIn. We're both very active on LinkedIn, got um, decent followings between us. Um, there's a lot of information. I know for myself, I put out three or four bits of content a week on LinkedIn. Um, advice, tips, guidance, um, hot topics. Um, so do follow us both on LinkedIn. Um, and if you've got something, if you want to talk about your own situation, um, call either of us for a, a conversation and a chat. Um, I do have, this is the only hard sell you ever get from me. I do have an in-depth uh, training course. It's five hours of video. Um, me to you. Um, do use that link. If you're looking to do a drill down, because we've just skimmed over the top, really, haven't we, Rena, in these three episodes, just to give you a flavour. Um, but there is a course there. Or, as I've kept on saying on each of the episodes, you can simply do nothing and let life unfold before you. There's our contact details. Um, do get in touch. Is there a final thought from you, Rena, before, I, uh, uh, before we sign off that you want to leave the audience? Uh, just watch these... Uh videos two or three times to actually digest it because there was a lot of information in there as well um, and as Rob, Rob said and echo what Rob said any questions you have feel free to contact either one of us we'd be happy to happy to answer them brilliant well again Rena thank you so much for your time and your input and your wise words your pearls of wisdom really um, really appreciated you uh, doubling up with me on this and uh, and thank you too uh, for listening watching um, and do feel free to contact as Rena says either of us if you've got a burning issue or topic that you want to chat through and you need a bit of a steer we're happy to hear from you okay cheerio everyone cheerio Rena catch up thank again. you Rob thank you everyone